Hey everyone, uh, my name is Sebastian McKenzie. Um, I go by SEB, SebMic on literally everything, so Twitter, GitHub, Facebook, everything like that. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about JavaScript transformation. Um, a little bit about how it works, what's possible, and how it relates to the React ecosystem. Um, so to provide some context, I started this project called 6 to 5 back at the start of October last year. Um, it started off as a learning project kind of thing. Um, and I realized that there was actually a large gap in my knowledge of like, how compilers and parsers worked. Um, so like basic computer science stuff. Um, and so this was my project to learn about that. Um, there was actually a problem with the name, uh, 6 to 5, uh, ES6 to ES, oh, ES6 to ES5. So what about when ES7 lands? Um, will it have to be renamed 7 to 5? But what about when ES6 is commonplace? Uh, 7 to 6. But wait, ES6 was renamed to ES2015. <sighs> so a name bound to a specific version in year was kind of pretty dumb um, in hindsight. So to combat this, the project was renamed to Babel. Um, and so with this transition became like an expansion in focus. So rather than just being a, like just an ES6 transpiler, um, it kind of became more generic. Um, and hopefully some of this talk will show that transition. Um, so the adoption of Babel has been pretty insane. Um, in a little over 10 months, it has been adopted and embraced by a wide range of companies and communities. Um, so now that I have a captive audience, I'd just like to thank everyone who uses Babel, um, and I guess indirectly supporting me through that. Um, JavaScript, Babel, and React has basically changed my life. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> So what is code transformation? Um, so it's a bit, pretty basic premise. Um, you put JavaScript in and you get JavaScript out. Um, the output JavaScript is inferred on what you put in. Um, so it infers what your code means, um, how it works and what it does in order to transform it. So yeah, how does this stuff all work? Um, so we have some source code uh, and we need a, some way to manipulate this. Uh, like how would you even begin to like do modifications on this source code. Um, so we need a data structure to represent this um, in a, that we can manipulate easily. So this data structure is called an abstract syntax tree, or AST for short. Um, so with the previous code, we turned it into a tree like this. Um, so it's a group of deeply nested objects that expressly defined each syntactic element um, of the code. Uh, so each property uh, contains metadata about what it actually represents. Um, so they all have types, so everything here, uh, it represents the semantics of the program. Um, all styling and stuff is basically thrown away since it's irrelevant. Um, so a much easier way to visualize this is via a graph. Um, so here each yeah, syntactic element represents a node. Um, and an even easier way to visualize this is just via a list. Um, this is probably more reflective of how Babel actually treats an AST internally. Um, since the order matters a lot, um, and a list kind of reflects that. So we have the source code in some data structure that we can deal with, um, but the story is a bit more complicated than that. So these are the three distinct phases of Babel. Um, there's a parser, which turns your source code into an AST, uh, the transformer, which then manipulates that AST and uh, transforms it, and then the generator turns the AST back into readable code. Um, now, here's how Babel compares to JS Transform, a now deprecated tool uh, by Facebook. Yeah. Uh, JS Transform mixes these two layers um, into one. So this actually makes writing these kind of transforms really tedious. Um, it takes, like, they're very brittle as well. Um, and they're way too verbose and complicated. Um, where I think this hasn't allowed, like, really rapid iteration. And this kind of separation of concerns has made, like, iterating on lots of stuff inside of Babel, um, like transforms, really easy and straightforward. So the first step uh, journey is at the parser. Um, so these are the two stages that we've gone through in the parser. Um, we have lexical analysis that turns the code into a stream of tokens, and syntactic analysis, which creates this tree from the tokens. So first up is lexical analysis. So what is a token? Um, so say we have this input source code, uh, where we categorize each chunk of the code into some distinct categories. Um, so here at the top, we have each of the token categories. Um, this is an, an, a comprehensive list. Um, it's just the token types that appear in this snippet of code. 
So here, each part has been identified to be of a certain value. And then here on the left is the list of tokens that we're going to deal with. Um, so we have these tokens now. How do we actually turn this into a, a tree that we can do stuff to? Um, so that's where syntactic analysis comes in, which turns these tokens into the data structure that we, we want. So you just say we have a simple class declaration. Um, we then tokenize it into something like this. Now we have in each distinct categories. Um, and then there's the tokens on the left. So how do we derive information from the tokens? Um, so here is basically, this is kind of a pseudo code -ish example of what one of the parser methods may look like. Um, so this will parse a class declaration. So let's like step through like kind of how this would work. Um, so first off, we, um, uh, yeah. So first off, we initialize our parser state. So on the left, the highlighted uh, part is the current token. And the part on the right is the line that we're currently executing. So we're on the class keyword, um, and we start the node. So we create an object. Um, and set like metadata on it, such as the location of this node in the source code. Um, so this is used for stuff like source maps um, and syntax errors and stuff like that. Um, so now that we've constructed this node, we progress to the next line. Uh, so here we expect the current token to be a class token. Um, and if it's not, then we throw a syntax error. Otherwise, we just proceed on. But luckily, it is a class, so, a class token, so we continue on. So now we've progressed to the identified token. Um, we run the uh, pass identifier, which adds an ID node to the class node. Um, and so then we progress to the next node, uh, which checks if the next token is a extends keyword. Um, so extends can, is optional, so we just have just a simple if statement. Um, and then if, that's, if there is an extends keyword, then we, get, we continue, we advance to the next token. Um, and then start passing the superclass as an expression, um, and then add that to the node. And then we advance, and then we move to this pass class body method, which will like pass class methods, properties, um, getters and setters, and all that. And then finally, we actually finish node. Uh, so this wraps it up. Um, it gives it a type and an end position. Uh, so now that we have this, so this is what the AST would look like. Um, so you can see the, the start and end properties that start node and finish node um, added. And then uh, you can see each element of that input source like clearly defined. Um, and so this would be the, the graph of that uh, previous code. Um, so we have the class ID, the superclass, and then the body. Uh, so now that we've covered the parser, let's move on to the transformer. Um, so again, the two main focuses of the transformer are we need, so we need some way to like, traverse this tree um, and another way to infer what these nodes actually represent. So when we're visiting nodes, we need to understand what they mean, um, depending on the context. So traversal. So we need some way to visit this tree uh, and conditionally apply operations on nodes. Um, so in order to do this, we'll introduce a concept called a visitor. Um, this controls the traversal state as well as controls how to deal with specific nodes of specific types. Um, so now that we have a visitor and an AST, we need to call it. Um, to do this, Babel employs a depth first pre-order traversal algorithm, a lot of words. Um, so it'll look a little something like this. Um, so we're incrementally uh, going through this tree, calling down, and the visitor is then performing operations on each node. Um, and at any point when visiting a node, it could be replaced or removed or some analysis performed on it. So now that we're actually visiting the node, we need like, some way to actually understand what a node means. Um, and we do this uh, through a process called static analysis, um, where we discern information about a node uh, depending on its position and placement. Um, so an example of this, um, so we've got this code uh, represented by uh, this tree. Now I see this addition happening, so the, the, the bar plus empty string. So we want to work out what the actual return type of this might be, like is it a sh will it result in a string or a number? Um, and so in order to do that, we, so in JavaScript, um, if you plus together two things, if, one of, if both of them are numbers, then it just adds numbers together. Otherwise, it just adds, uh, pretends they're strings um, and then concatenates them. Um, 
So first we need to check if, um, the, if is the left side a, a number or a string, can we identify the type of it to determine if it's a number or not. Um, so we just got bar, it could be a global, um, we're not quite sure of what the type actually is, it doesn't really matter. But then we progress to the right hand side and we can determine that it's a string. So this expression will always return a string. Um, this is a very simple example, um, but you can kind of see how this can bubble out to like a really large, on, on, onto a larger scale to infer some like, really complicated stuff. Um, so stack analysis has very practical implications too that are actually implemented in Babel. So, so we've got this array destructuring declaration. Um, we need to transpile this, so it's fairly straightforward. Um, we assign the right-hand side to a temporary variable, and then we just assign each index to the bindings contained in the original array pattern. Um, but this is kind of a dumb transformation. Um, it, like, it, there can be a lot of, you can simplify a lot of these transforms depending on the context. Um, and so we can actually unroll this into something like this. So this is what Babel turns it into. Um, here we save on an array allocation um, for a common case. Um, and so we can be completely confident that it's as performant or simple as possible. Um, and performing the static analysis is actually a secondary data structure to the AST that's used. Um, it's kind of decoupled, but also heavily tied. I know that doesn't really make any sense, but um, this is the concept of a path. So this is a way to get bidirectional flow between an AST um, that represents relationships. Um, I'll try and explain it. So, uh, this is an AST, so it's unidirectional, so you can only go down. Uh, so there's no way to get access to the parent or ancestry if you just have reference to a node. Um, so say we just have this node, uh, suddenly the ancestry has disappeared since we don't have reference to that. Um, it could be stored on a property on the actual node, like this is the parent, but what if the parent changes um, or, or we want to reuse a node in multiple ancestry hierarchies? Um, so it, it's kind of problematic. So in order, so, and as well, like if, so if another node appears, so let's say the, so the function expression before was the initializer of the variable declaration, um, but now it's changed to an identifier. Um, and so most of the time when you're transforming code, you just want to deal with relationships rather than the exact node. So you might only care about the initializers of a variable. Um, and then if another transform happens that changes that initializer, suddenly your reference is out of date. Um, so how do we kind of get around this? So I'll just pick one of the uh, identifiers and like flatten its hierarchy. Um, and so this is a flat list. So if we introduce the concept of a path that represents the relationships of a node relative to its parent, so its relationships, um, we get a tree something like this. Um, so this allows us to flow upwards on the tree and like sideways and like if you just have reference to these relationships then um, it's much more performant and it's much more easier to reason about. Um, so, and this tree, it, the paths, the relationships, so they're reactive to tree changes. So if another part of the tree updates, um, all these paths are kind of propagated and they're reactive to those changes. Um, so you can kind of pitch this as a tree on top of a tree um, that allows you to go upwards as well as down uh, while an AST just, uh, the current, as in the AST and Babel just allows you to go down. So it represents the relationships between nodes. So this concept of a node path is an extremely powerful concept um, that allows these paths to be reactive to tree changes and have multiple interoperating transformations that all work together very seamlessly. So these node paths allow us to do something called contextless replacement, um, basically transforming broken code to correct code. Um, so for example, here we have a simple array destructuring assignment. Um, we can explode this pretty easily to this. Um, so we assign a temporary variable that, uh, that runs that, uh, that calls that function, um, and then it assigns x and y to the indexes. Um, but this is in a statement position. What about an expression position? So say we have something like this. Um, what the first argument to do something should actually be the result of call, uh, calculate coordinates. Um, and if we use the exact same transform as we did on a statement, I uh, would get something like this, uh, which is broken code. Um, so this doesn't really make any sense. So in JavaScript, statements and expressions are different things. Um, but in Babel, expressions and statements are kind of the same thing. Um, so Babel understands JavaScript and kind of how it works. 
And so using the exact same transformation, it turns it into this. Um, so it retains the actual original uh, result that the, it, using the exact same transformer, it's inferred kind of what it was meant to mean um, and then transform it so it automatically works and has the correct semantics. Um, so let's move on to generation. Um, so there are two phases of the generator. Um, it infers the style of the original code. Um, so stuff like what type of quotes you use, what indentation, um, and then the actual code generation which turns the tree into code based on the style information that is inferred. Um, I'm not really gonna go into any detail here since it's kind of boring, but um, feel free to find me and ask questions if you're curious. Um, so this is an overview of the entire flow that Babel goes through. So it goes through the parser, which goes through lexical analysis, then syntactic analysis, then passes it to the transformer, which traverses the tree, manipulates it, performs static analysis, and then gives that ASC to the code generator to turn back into code. So how is this useful? We're at React Europe. Um, what does this kind of mean? Uh, so this kind of some of the stuff you can do with this that benefit the React community. Um, so a big one is JSX optimization. So traditionally, JSX has just been like a one-to-one -one mapping. So it, it's just been kind of syntax sugar for function calls. Um, there hasn't really been any more additional semantics imposed on it. Um, but what if we could apply some additional semantics to JSX elements that would make your code faster or more performant? Um, so one of these magic tricks that we can do is constant elements. Uh, so it's basically the idea that if a React element is conceptually equivalent, then if it, it, the, a React element is conceptually equivalent if all of its values are the same. Um, so what does this actually mean? Um, well, it means that this method would always return the same value. So um, the render, calling render would triple equals render. Um, so here we call it twice, and so, so the node is, a, the element is only constructed once rather than twice um, as it's been identified as a constant. So we do this through constant hoisting. So in React 0, 013 and under, um, this would kind of be what React would expect. Um, so it's just, yes, yeah, syntax sugar. For, uh, every single time you call render, it would return uh, multiple elements. But in React 0, 014 and plus, um, this is kind of what would be supported. And um, we actually hoist that the element creation outside of the method um, and then return a reference in its place. Um, this is similar, a, a similar kind of concept to Ember's Glimmer where um, React could uh, identify that this element hasn't changed um, since it's constant. Um, that's kind of what Glimmer does where um, it can tell what's constant and doesn't change and skips um, kind of the diffing of that. Um, and so another one, another optimization that we can apply is uh, pre-building elements ahead of time. Um, so here we have this simple JSX code. Um, we've got a div with a class name with an expression container containing bar and a bar component with a key. Um, so this can be turned into the following representation. So this is actually what uh, react.createElement does under the hood, but here we're doing it ahead of time. Um, you sh this is only really appropriate for production since react.createElement actually throws um, a lot of errors or warnings that are helpful um, in development. Um, so you'd only really want to use this for production. Um, so this can also be combined with constant hoisting, uh, the constant element stuff to get like some uh, performance wins there. So another area that Babel can come in handy is syntax extensions. Um, so there's a lot of experimental syntax that can make re writing React applications far easier. Um, but before we go into that, a little disclaimer. Um, so there's a lot of abuse with ES7 syntax. Um, well, not really abuse, but in the way that it's kind of framed. Um, so when something, when somebody says that something's going to be in ES7, um, it's not really. Like, they're just proposals. Um, there's no guarantee of its stability, um, whether it's going to be included or even if it's a good idea or not. Um, so that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use this stuff. Just take that into consideration that in the future it may not be standard. Um, so let's go over three, experiment, three different experimental syntaxes that make writing React applications far easier. Um, so a big one is class properties. So this is actually a proposal by Jeff Morrison from Facebook who works on Flow. 
Um, so as some of you may know, you can only define methods inside a class body. Um, but sometimes you may want to add instance properties. Um, so you can do this in the constructor, but there should really be a more declarative way to do this. Um, this can be done through class properties. Um, so this allows you to put these properties in the body. Um, another is decorators. So this provides a way to uh, modify class method descriptors as well as wrap classes um, in a very composable way. Um, so here we've got an autobind decorator that returns a getter that automatically binds. So any reference to this dot get full name uh, return a bound, will return a bound method. Um, so instead of when you go this dot get full name, um, it automatically bind it to this, so you don't have to do this dot get full um, name dot bind this. Um, so an another fairly recent one is the bind syntax. So this adds syntax for function binding and allows you to chain together methods in a very functional but object-oriented way. Um, it's kind of weird, but a, a lot of people like it, so maybe you will too. Um, so it's time to wrap up, so I thought I'd give some rough points about what's in store for Babel in the future. Um, so a big one that I see is focusing on dead code elimination and minification. Um, so Babel can statically analyze a lot about your code already, but imagine if it was integrated with a tool like um, Flow, which has access to your entire dependency graph. Um, so this means that Flow could help out in doing extremely good um, dead code elimination and minification. So they would kind of eliminate the arguments of, oh, this library is way too big, um, since only the parts you actually use will be included in your payload that you send to the browser. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of explore this area. Um, so another is constant folding and static evaluation. Uh, so this will allow Babel to meta-interpret your code ahead of time. Um, this may, this will probably slow down compilation, but um, it could possibly lead to massive wins both on the minification and performance side. Um, and so the last is static analysis and linting. Um, so a lot of current linters kind of just focus on bindings and style when there's a lot more, um, lot more to linting like type checking um, and stuff like that where current linters don't really touch. Um, so something like flow is almost conceptually equivalent to something like um, flow, uh, ESLint. Um, so in that it helps to catch bugs in code. So there's a lot more to linting than just code style. Um, and so all of this is a step in the direction of an absolutely awesome DX experience. So in the process of finding this image, I found out that DX not only stands for developer experience, but also is the name of a wrestling event. Um, so try not to get those confused. Sort of like a React fight club where you fight over Flux implementations. Um, <laughs> So I would love to hear your thoughts and ideas on how to make Babel uh, the most effective tool for code transformation and analysis. So feel free to find me or ask some questions um, or, if you, or offer ideas. Um, so thank you. Um, so there's six minutes left, so does anyone have any questions? Yep. Yep, uh, so the question was about how the kind of integration with Flow would work, because um, Babel's in JavaScript and Flow is in OCaml. Um, so it'd probably have to be some sort of like transmission layer, I'm not like completely sure, so there'd have to be some way for either flow to dump out information um, about what it's inferred from the code, and then Babel would consume that, or there might be some sort of communication layer between the two, so you might have a long, so you can have a long running flow process, and then Babel could query it for certain information. Um, that'll likely be the most performant and likely way that it would happen, um, if at all. Yep. Uh, um, yeah, there's no current like proposals to type annotations, no. Why, well, yes, like 
a lot of the stuff coming out of the React community is kind of agnostic. Um, so like Relay and GraphQL can be applied to a large range of applications. So a lot of this stuff um, isn't really React specific, but it does benefit React, the React community in a big way um, since it's, yeah, yeah. It, it borrows a lot of kind of the React ideas and philosophies. Yep. Yeah, so that's kind of what you would need to do for like module bundling. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about how to approach that um, since you don't want to go and re-implement Browserify or Webpack. Um, but then once you kind of step back and think about it more, um, kind of what Browserify and Webpack do is just like code transformation where it's transforming a whole bunch of files into one. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of tools that all have the same concepts, that they're all very separate. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, or at least providing a, a way to provide your dependency graph to Babel would be a cool idea. Um, so Babel could, like, so when you, currently when you import something, um, it doesn't throw an error when you're importing something that isn't actually explicitly exported in the other file. Um, and so that's because, yeah, it's just a single file transform. You have no context about the other files around it. Um, so having access to the dependency graph, um, like, yeah, having access to multiple files would benefit with that. Yep. Have you tried any experimental work with WebAssembly or other or other Yep, so, yeah, WebAssembly, so the question was about, um, if I played around with WebAssembly and how this kind of fits into this. Um, so I don't think like just compiling normal JavaScript to WebAssembly probably won't be really that beneficial. Um, but something like a heavily typed JavaScript using flow annotations um, could possibly be a really good compile target for, um, to WebAssembly. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if the JavaScript or React community will shift to that, but it could potentially lead to significant performance wins. Anybody else? No. Yep. Let's say some of those front end supports get rejected. Yep. Um, will they be kept in balance if they're useful, or will we then separately move them? For example, the binary, let's say. Yeah. Um, so the question was about how uh, rejected proposals will be handled um, in Babel. Um, so I'm currently thinking about how to do syntax plugins. Um, so potentially in the future of something, eventually everything in Babel is going to be a plugin. Um, and there might be like a default set of plugins that are enabled. Um, but yeah, it's kind of hard to do that. Um, but syntax plugins are definitely on the roadmap. Um, and then eventually if something was deprecated or rejected, it would be put into a plugin so you could continue to use it. Um, yeah, I've been like I've been trying to think about like how to handle like non-standard syntax um, and what are the pros and cons of that, um, and it's leaning more towards the pros where like it like doesn't really matter if something's not standard. Um, I guess it does by default, but if you have like the option to pull in non-standard things, um, like they benefit your workflow and your team understands them, um, then there's like no real downsides um, besides being bound to a compiler. 30 seconds left. Yep. So, so Babel is really, I mean, that's a front end that targets JavaScript and a back end that generates JavaScript, and you're adding these augmentation steps. Have, have you ever considered leveraging something like LLVM and existing toolkit where you have a the back end parsing JavaScript and, a, and a, uh, sorry, a back end generating JavaScript and a front end parsing JavaScript, and you'll get a lot of these optimizations for free? Yep. Uh, so the question was about like using LLVM for kind of the performance optimizations. Um, I haven't really like looked into that much, but uh, it's definitely an area that I'd be interested in looking into. Um, I guess one of the advantages of just having an impure JavaScript be like how easy it is to kind of use, and so um, integrate like having other requirements um, may be kind of tricky. Like Babel has a requirement where it has to run in the browser if you want to use it with something like System JS. Um, so that kind of puts some limitations on what can be done. Um, uh, yeah, um, so yeah, it would definitely be interesting to kind of 
investigate and explore that more. Um, so I'm out of time. So thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>